Good morning, church. We are so pleased that you've invited us here for this service, and it's wonderful to see nearly a full house as as any pastor would look out and and be pleased to have a a full service. Um, We are... uh, going to have a special presentation today, and I know I see friendly faces out here that, that know me and say, oh yeah, he's part of that biker group, and don't really know what it is that we do, and I, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to share that with them as well as the rest of you, because we are just like you are, except that we have a passion for motorcycles. So it's not just riding the motorcycles, but reaching out to the motorcyclists Our organization started, well, let let me rephrase that. Um, Never underestimate the power of God's planning, what he does. The CMA started out with a father-son relationship where the father and son wanted to do something together and they rode motorcycles. Soon they began to uh, attend uh, secular motorcycle events and noticed the absence of Jesus at those organizations, those functions. And they prayed about it and said, we would like to do something about it. And back around 1974, 1975, they were able to start this organization known as the Christian Motorcyclist Association. And you'll see in our presentation uh, how much it's grown and how, how widely across the world even that we support not just reaching out to the motorcycle community, uh, but also we have some special ministries that we support that uh, nearly touch every nation on earth, and we'll go go into that as well. So what is it that we do? As motorcyclists, we go to where the motorcyclists go. So if that means that they have a, a secular rally or whatever, we will go and we will do things like serve a free breakfast. We will be try to show Jesus' love to them and open up the door, plant the seed that might that has, quite frankly, brought many of them to the Lord. But there's still a great challenge that's out there, and there are so many souls that need to be saved. So that's where our passion is, is that we reach out to the, to the motorcyclist community primarily, although don't restrict us that way. We're Christians just like you are, and anywhere that we can share the gospel or share God's love, we will do that. And uh, we have a a short uh, video presentation that will kind of give you a very quick summary of of what it is that that CMA does. And then uh, right after that video, uh, uh, Brother Dave Helm will come up and talk about the Run for the Sun Ministries that the Christian Motorcyclist Association supports. Of their sins till Jesus came and set them free. Now 
Our purpose and the plan is to go to every nation and reach out to every man. We've chosen to be servants of a great and higher call as we give the praise and glory to the one who loves us all. We're an army full of soldiers who've been wounded in the past, but now we bear the banner of the cross upon our backs. No weapon. Against us, we'll be able to prevail. We're riding straight to victory as we storm the gates of hell. We'll ride with the passion, we'll ride with the wind. We'll carry in our hearts the only hope for every man. Through mountains and valleys, we'll ride until we come. For all the children who are broken by disease, we ride for every prisoner who's lost the will to leave. We ride to where the sons of darkness gather in the land. We ride to bring the light of hope and love to every man. We're riding for the soldiers who've given up. Hi, my name is Dave Helm, and I'm the run for the Sun lead for the San Pedro Servants. And as you can see, the Ministry of the Christian Motorcyclist Association is worldwide. Um, here in the States, about 40% of the money that uh, the Run for the Sun uh, fundraising uh, attempts go to uh, national events, uh, and about 60% then is split between those three missionary partners throughout the world. Uh, last year, uh, we were able to give about a million dollars to each of those three partners throughout the world. And uh, uh, one of them reported back that for every dollar spent, a soul was saved. Um, the pastors in these uh, countries, uh, the mountainous countries, cannot reach their, their people uh, without transportation. So with a motorcycle, they can go up over the pass and get into that valley where, surprisingly enough, people have not heard about the gospel of Christ, even to this day. So it's a, it's a wonderful blessing to be able to be a part of an organization that uh, has uh, the tools and the ability to magnify their reforce, resources in that manner. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's just an incredible thing. And plus, we like motorcycles, so it's a win-win. There's no, there's no down to it. Um, but uh, the Ministry of the Christian Motorcyclists Association was founded out of a desire 
to reach out to others with the love of Jesus. From the very beginning, the vision of CMA has been about changing the world one heart at a time. And that's really all you have to do if, if you're going to go out and minister to people is one person, one time, plant the seed and give them a better life. Give them hope. We believe this is a scriptural command for every Christian and Christian organization to play their part in fulfilling the great commission found in Matthew 29 or 28, 19, where Jesus tells us, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, we cover your prayers for the mission, uh, for the evangelical, uh, evangelistic uh, outreach of uh, Run for the Sun. And if you choose to uh, give, that's the only kind of a fundraiser that the uh, Run for the Sun, uh, uh, that the Christian motorcyclists do. Um, and uh, we're going to have some testimonies of how the Christian Motorcyclists Association actually reached uh, real people. And I'll first uh, introduce my friend Mike Perez, uh, my friend and brother in Christ. Hi, I'm Mike, and I'm an alcoholic. Oh, wait, wrong meeting. <laughs> wrong meeting, I'm sorry. No, my name is Mike. Um, my writing buddies call me Moses. I tend to get lost and wander around out in the desert for 40 years. <laughs> I, was, I was raised a Catholic, and I, I always said after I got out of high school and basically quit going to church and anything to do with religion, I said, Jesus is my co-pilot. That was my excuse for a lot of years. I took him into a lot of dark places being my co-pilot, places that I never should have gone, much less taking Jesus with me. Well, I wound up in jail. Three felony arrests in a very short period of time. By the time I was in there for the third time, I figured I was going to be here for a little while. I might as well see what's going on in here. So they play pinochle and Scrabble, and those are good things. It's, what are you guys doing every afternoon? You're all going into a little room there by yourselves. Okay, so we're doing an AA meeting. That's probably not a bad idea. <laughs> First thing is admit you're powerless, and yeah, that's pretty powerless. He said, find your higher power. Said, well, Jesus has been my co-pilot for years. I know right where he is. Then he started doing Bible studies, that sounds like it might not be a bad idea, too. I started doing the Bible studies and started studying First John. And I finally figured that uh, I better give him the wheel and hand him the keys and let him drive, because I wasn't doing a real good job on my own. <laughs> so that's my testimony. I gave my, my heart, my soul, my everything to Jesus Christ back in 2006. Have never looked back been the best thing I ever did in my life. I've been through some real rough patches since then, but I know with God leading the way, I'll make it through every one of them. Amen. Next, I'd like to introduce Brother Indio. Morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, I want to thank you guys for inviting us here. This is always awesome. Um, I first give thanks to the Lord, our Heavenly Father, for His Son, for His sacrifice, um, to, for us to be here. I um, also give thanks to our military soldiers that also give us a chance to be here. Um, one thing I know is that I always try to hold on to the Lord. Jesus. I grew up on a, a south side of Tucson in Barrios, you know, gangs, you know, gang infested and all, you know, the schools, everything. It, it was bad. Uh, but I stayed away from them. I, I didn't let them recruit me. Um, I was, uh, I finally had my first encounter with them when I was 13 with uh, five of my friends. 
I grew up on the bank of the river there in the Barrios. We always played down in the river, you know. It was out there with our BB guns. We were about 13 years old. Um, when eight, eight gang members from one of the roughest gangs in the south side of Tucson come up to us, and, um, well, I stood there like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, all my fr I look back, all my friends ran. It's like, well, I, I, they got me, took my gun, uh, started beating me, hung me off a 40-foot cliff, tried to throw me off. First, they threw my dog off because he was trying to help me, you know. And I, all I could hear is him slam in the ground and ran off crying. The Lord saved him. He was good. Um, I was hanging. When I, when I was getting thrown off, I, hang on, I hung on to one leg and another leg. You know, two guys, and as they kicked me repeatedly in the head and the shoulders and tried to get me to fall off, I, I, I refused. And then that's when I knew that Jesus was there holding me, because there's no way. And these guys were 18, 19 years old. Uh, there's no way they couldn't have got me off of them, you know. But the two I had a hold of said, "No way, pull him up, pull him up. He's not letting go." I mean, he's so they pulled me up threw me down, gave me my BB gun, and then they went on their way, and I just got up and walked away, walked home. I was a little mad at my friends, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I don't blame them, you know. <laughs> um, the following week, we was down there again, and, and here they come again. This time they were, they all had 22 pellet pump guns, you know, rifles. So we said, I said again, oh no, and again my friends ran. <laughs> so what I did was I sat down, because I know Jesus was saved me some way again. I was praying. Um, I sat down. They ran past me like I wasn't even there, and they shot every single one of my friends. And uh, and an older gentleman on his horse was down in the river, tried to stop him. They sh they shot him repeatedly and the horse. And, um, and they all survived. They all were bloody welts, and, you know, they hurt in 22 caliber. Um, luckily, it ain't these days where they're using real guns. You know, it's, uh, it's a shame. So I pray for somehow we reach. We can't reach these gangs with violence. We've got to reach them with care. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, so throughout my life, Jesus is always there holding my hand. Pulling me out of all the stuff that that I would walk into, you know, and, and get into. So I, um, and now I won't let go of his hand. So I, I, I thank him every day. Uh, he moves me. Um, I'm, I'm trying. It's hard from where I come from, but I love him number one. Um, and I'm, you know, I grew up Catholic. I got. Uh, this year, since I've joined this beautiful gang <laughs> that, I, that I love, um, I brought nine of my Catholic family to Christ. And I, so, uh, it's, it's, it, it's been awesome. Um, and I thank God again, always. And I thank you all again for letting me share my testimony. Um, love, peace, the Lord, always. Um, I want to introduce my brother Sparky, one of my great mentors. Good morning. Moses, Indio, you guys are a tough act to follow, let me tell you. Great to be here in the house of the Lord, or as I refer to it, another one of my clubhouses where I like to hang out. Nice to see all you people here. Thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, I promise I will keep this short and not bore everybody. Thank you very much. I, I'm serious. I guess uh, my story goes back a bit farther than uh, the one gentleman uh, spoke about. Um, my day is uh, 29 years ago this past March. Um, I had gotten, I was brought up in a uh, 
conservative church, a lot of legalistic stuff. Seemed like as soon as I got old enough, I could not run fast and far enough from God. I just didn't want anything to do with it. So as a young man, you get into things that you think are so important. You get into partying, being that guy, trying one drug after another. Pretty soon you get to the point that you don't even realize that you're having to pour whiskey in your coffee in the morning just to get the shakes under control so you can make it through noon. Then at noon, you're having a couple beers with lunch and having shots of whiskey just to keep the shakes at bay and to keep the almost a permanent hangover that's looming over over you. And then at nighttime would come around, then you name it, I would do it um, as far as drugs go. This went on for several years of my life. Not knowing that uh, deep down I was searching for something, something that I did not find in any of the bottles that I drank to the bottom of, that the answers were not there. One night was about 2 o'clock in the morning. It had pretty much run its course. I had drank all I could drink. I had smoked all I could smoke. I had snorted. I had swallowed everything. That thing that I am thankful for is God gave me a phobia of needles back then that kept me from mainlining stuff, but it didn't mean you couldn't snort it. And I pretty much did everything that I could to destroy myself. About 30, 2 o'clock in the morning, somewhere around that hour, I decided I'd had enough. I looked up to the heavens and I said, God, if you're real like my mom and dad say you are, you're going to have to show me because I'm done. I walked over, pulled the pistol out of my out of the holster, the last gun that I had not sold, pulled the hammer back, stuck it in my mouth. My phone started ringing. I almost pulled the trigger. I set the gun down, cocked and loaded. I walked over and I picked up the phone. Two o'clock in the morning. It was my mother. I said, Mom, what are you doing? She asked me, Mark, are you okay? And completely broke down. No, Mom, I'm not. What's the matter? Everything, Mom. It's all a mess. I was in that dark room, that dark place, right, where Satan wanted me to be. And I was just praying, God, please, somebody turn on the light. And he did. I asked him, if you're real, show me. He had mom call me. I knew God was real. (laughs) Mom prayed with me that night. My life changed. And that was 29 years ago, this past March. Um, It's had its struggles. Um, It's been uh, the greatest decision I've ever made in my life. Um, Trying to figure out exactly different things about keeping God as your co-pilot and really he should be your navigator, your, um, (laughs) your pilot and your communications officer, because he's the one that we need to talk to. So we get, I get through most of my Christian life, just kind of cruising. Everything was okay. And, uh, it ended up, uh, joining a different, uh, motorcycle club and wanted to ride. I held three offices in that club And it just seemed like between the job and everything else going on in life, I wasn't able to ride. And I really wanted to. Well, people in the chapter weren't happy with me because I wasn't riding. I wasn't happy with me because I wasn't riding. My motorcycle, Kablooey, he wasn't happy because I wasn't riding. So he just sat in the garage all the time getting garage rash. So poor thing. And uh, really wasn't serving anything. And uh, God called my father home three years ago last August and called him home to be with the Lord. And uh, I realized at that point that uh, I'd made a huge blunder in my Christian walk, that I had done exactly what God tells us not to, and that's put no other false gods before him. 
and I was worshiping that motorcycle. I uh, realized that. I offered to God. I said, God, I'm, I'm going to put Kablooey up for sale. And I said, I want you to show me what you want me to do to serve you for the rest of my life. I remember sitting in church sometimes hearing people, missionaries, get up and talk about their experiences going, oh, thank, thank you, God, for not calling me to that. Thank you, God, for not calling me to be a pastor of a church. Thank you, God, for not calling me to go witness to people. Thank you, God, for not calling me to do this and that. Well, I got to keep the motorcycle. 30 minutes after I'd prayed and I offered that motorcycle up, God said, I want you to keep the motorcycle, but I want you to serve me on it. I got to ride two years ago and two years in a row. I got to ride that very same motorcycle in a church in Safford without law enforcement coming after me to get me. <laughs> now, you can't make that kind of stuff up. So in a nutshell, whether you're here today, if you know Christ as your savior, great. I'm glad to hear it. If you don't, Maybe what I'm saying has, is, is speaking to you. Maybe Christ is calling you. My suggestion would be answer the phone. Or maybe what I went through in my Christian walk may be speaking to you. Maybe what Tony is go, Brother Tony is going to bring in his service today, maybe that's going to speak to you. Maybe God will be calling you to his service, into a ministry. If God is calling you, answer the phone. Don't wait. Anyways, glad you're all here today. Thank you for your time. Doc, Brother Tony, I'd like to turn the services over to you. We're huggers. Did you guys notice? <laughs> Can you all hear me okay? I got this lapel thing on. I got all this technology up here. I used to, you know, do sermons on yellow legal pad, and now I'm using laptops and applications, if I can get this thing to work. Um, I want to thank Pastor Dennis and Pastor Tim for having us out here on this first of what I hope will be many Biker Sundays. Um, we started this Biker Sunday stuff uh, last year with what we called church crashes or church invasions. At our uh, January officers meeting, um, we sit down and we started planning out literally on a map all these different uh, places, churches in Cochise County. Cochise County is kind of big. And um, we would go the first time under the auspices of a crash or an invasion. And uh, if they liked us, they would bring us back. And um, then the next year, it was a Biker Sunday, where we would do the message, do testimonies. Aren't testimonies great? And why are testimonies great? Testimonies are great because all of us have them. Nobody starts off being Christ-centered. We all start on a spiritual journey. It starts at the same place, right there, and it ends at the same place. But all that stuff in the middle, which becomes the testimony, is the stuff we're supposed to share with one another to help strengthen, encourage one another to keep going. So a couple of weeks ago, I was up in Tucson, and I was officiating a wedding. And uh, during the uh, rehearsal, Everybody's getting introduced to everybody. And uh, I got introduced to Pastor Tim. And uh, we started talking, and I was like, yeah, you know, um, I'm part of the CMA. And he's like, oh, yeah, I know a CMA guy. And I was like, really, who? And he said, Dave Helm. And I said, yeah, yeah I'm going to be uh, speaking at his church here in a couple weeks. He goes, that's my church, man. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of what is, is turning into an awesome relationship. How many of you know when the Spirit connects like Jesus and John in the belly of their mothers, they, they just start leaping because it's that common bond. It's that common spirit that ties us all together. 
And for two weeks now, I've been, I've been just, I, I couldn't wait to get here. And man, you guys have not let me down. This is an awesome body of believers here. When, yeah, give yourselves a hand. During praise and worship, all I could think of was like, wow, God is here. And it's such an awesome feeling when we come together and praise and worship like that and usher him into the sanctuary and things just start happening. Amen? Amen. So I better get going on this because I, I told my brothers and sisters, when I start getting going on God, I don't look at the clock, but they got one of them big vaudeville hooks to come get me if I start getting a little too long-winded. I love talking about the Lord, and I got a great, relatively short message here for you, but I think you'll be able to take these principles away with you and apply them to your life. What God gave me to give you today has to deal with change. If you haven't noticed, our world is changing around us at record pace. And it is very easy to get discouraged if you're not talking to God. There's white noise, there's distractions. It's just relatively not good when you turn on the TV or go on the internet, even talking with your coworkers. It's, it's just not good. But if you're in communication with God, God will let you know that even though it might look bad out there, he's getting ready to do something big. Everybody should be excited about it. God's getting ready to do something big. That's what I'm talking about. So if, I love if-then statements, if God is getting ready to do something big, then it, 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 we're obligated to be ready for it. Even though you might hear all that negative stuff out there, as, as we go to these different churches, what, what are we hearing? Record numbers of people joining the church. Exponential growth. Discipleship. Mentoring. People coming to the altar. God's getting ready to do something big. It's all about change. As I mentioned just a minute ago about this spiritual path that starts here, and ends when we're done changing and we go on to glory. I want to answer three questions today for you guys. And it has to do with transformation and change. I want to talk about what is transformation, why do we need to change, and how do we change. Let me make sure I can scroll down here. Right? And my arms are not long enough anymore. <laughs> In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and I like to use the Amplified because there's just more words to explain what God's talking about. Amen? In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible says, And do not be conformed to this world. Well, I could drop the mic right there. Any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually, once again lending to that spiritual journey that we're all on. By the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan, not ours, and purpose for you. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, the Bible goes further to state, we are progressively being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to even more glory. So that answers question number one, what is transformation? You ever, I'm sure you all have heard the analogy of the potter and the potter's wheel. You ever seen that? I am definitely not artistic in that manner, but I've seen it in the movies and on YouTube where this yucky red piece of clay is on this wheel and all you see is the hands of the potter and in the analogy of course where that yucky piece of red clay and God's hands are transforming us into something beautiful 
So as the wheels start spinning and the hands move in there, all of a sudden this blob starts to move and take shapes and starts getting the curves and the speed picks up. And as long as the hand is in there, something beautiful is emerging. But you ever see when they take the hand off? It just goes back to being that blob again. While the hand is in there, something beautiful is being created. But when the hand is taken off, does everybody feel where I'm going with that? I have four things that you can apply to your life. Some of them are going to sound like Captain Obvious is up here talking on that hotel commercial. It's simple, yet so many believers miss out on what God has in store for them because they don't understand these principles, but even more so, they don't apply them. So can you take four things with you today after you hear this word and leave these doors and go out? That shouldn't be too hard. Transformative principle number one. What do I mean by that? Am I getting ready to teach chemistry class here? No. We're not going to talk about any chemical compounds being added to such and such. We're not talking about the Incredible Hulk metamorphosizing. We're talking about transformative principles. Principles, a standard that, when applied, will help you manage and do this thing called change. Number one is communication. Like I said, this sounds very obvious, but many don't practice it. I saw a meme on Facebook the other day, and it said, don't you dare say that God is quiet if your Bible is closed. Let that sink in for a minute. These principles that I'm going to talk about don't necessarily have to be done in order, but they all have to be done. Some of them make more sense in a specific order, but just remember they all have to be done, and that first one is communication. One of the, one of the awesome things I love about Jesus during his ministry while he was here on earth was that he never asked anybody to do anything that he wouldn't show them how to do first. Whether it was servant leadership, washing his disciples' feet, how to love, how to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And the night before the most important day in history, what did the Son of God do? He communicated with the Father. Now let's think about that for a second. Emmanuel, God with us here on earth, part of the Holy Trinity. The day before the most important day in the history of earth, he communicated with God. And you all have probably have the picture in your mind right now in the Garden of Gethsemane. My God, my God, if, if it's your will, take this cup. You know, we, we, all, we all see Jesus as as is probably his most human at that point, crying out to God. Something going on on the screen? I saw everybody look up. <laughs> and you can find that, uh, that scripture in, whoop, Lord, have mercy. I, I guess I need a slide flipper. in the Garden of Gethsemane, and in, in, uh, I think it's Matthew 26, where Jesus is communicating. The principle of communication cannot be underestimated. Even the most mundane things that we go through in our normal, daily, unimportant life, communication with God is critical. If Jesus did it to help him navigate that next day that we're all familiar with, why can't we do the same thing in our lives? I've applied this principle in my life, and it makes a huge difference. Because then I'm not leaning on my own understanding. I'm leaning on God to get me through that next day. 
The next principle is vision. So if you're communicating with God, you get this thing called vision. And the simple definition of vision is the ability to see or just plain sight, something imagined or pictured in your mind, kind of like faith. Or maybe it's a dream or part of a supernatural experience. How many people dream and hear God talk to them in their dreams? There's a precedent for it in the Bible. God talked to a lot of people in dreams. John on the island of Patmos. Joseph, of course. From the pit to the prison to the pulpit. God gave Joseph dreams. But Joseph found out that when he shared those dreams with people, it always wasn't received very well. So a lesson to us is, when you're communicating with God and receiving God's vision, have a little discretion about who you tell. You might want to go to your pastor first and run it by him. Get some validation. Pray about it. But vision is a, is a very important principle that comes after communication. You know, we saw it in Job 33 and in Genesis 37 with Joseph. And what do we know about vision? Without it, the people perish. The bottom line is, when you get your vision for God's purpose in your life, it is the best feeling in the world. A couple of years ago, I had my first book published. Never in a million years did I think that I would sit down and write a book. And it's the title of it is A Sun for All Seasons, which in a nutshell is about change. For whatever reason, God gave me a gift of the ability to recognize patterns um, in, in my life. And things kept happening over and over again. And I'd be like, why? Well, when I sat down and communicated with God and he showed me his vision for my life, I got those answers. And I was able to see why all that stuff happened in each of those seasons of my life and where he was there the whole time. It's, it's like you now have a secret between you and God, you and Daddy. In Job 33, 14 to 16, it, the Bible says, For God speaks once and even twice. Why has he got to talk to us twice? Because sometimes we don't get it the first time. Yeah. Yet no one notices it, including you, Job. <laughs> he could, I could stick Tony in there. In a dream, a vision of the night, one may hear God's voice when deep sleep falls on men while slumbering upon the bed. Then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. You ever think about why he would have to come to us in a vision of the night while we're sleeping? Because he has our attention. We're not on the internet. We're not watching TV. We're not at work. He's got us right where we, he wants us. The key takeaway here is it's your vision delivered to you by God that's for you. It's for you. And when you implement it, it's for you. Because everything that we get, whether it's a talent, a gift, a gifting, is not about us. It's about how we take it to the body and bless someone else. Amen? Amen. Principle number three. How am I doing on time, guys? All right. Principle number three is inspiration. Definitions of inspiration include the act of influencing, the action or power of moving the intellect and emotion, divine influence or action on a person believed to qualify them, to receive and communicate sacred revelation. I tried to look up the Hebrew word or the Greek word for inspiration and didn't have much luck. But, and it's not really used in, in that sense in the Bible, but inspiration, when you break it down into its root, has to deal with breath or breathing, that spire, like respiration. It's God's breath or fuel that keeps us moving forward. 
Example of this is in Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 39 and 40. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may reverently fear me forever, for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will do them good and not turn away from them. And I will put in their heart a reverent fear and reverential awe of me, so that they will not turn away from me. You think of those marathon runners when they're in mile 22 of 26. Their legs and I've never done a full marathon, but I did do a half, and it was one of the worst experiences of my life. <laughs> Even just 13 miles, around mile 10, my, my feet feel like cement. My legs are about to fall off. I, I, I don't even know if I'm breathing at this point. But then there's somebody with some water waiting on the side of the road. And that water hits the lips, goes down, and all of a sudden I got a little bit more energy to go the rest of the distance. That gets at the heart or the principle of inspiration, and that's what we do for each other. That's what comes out of those testimonies. When you hear it, when your spirit hears it, and you go, you know, I went through something like that too. It's not just me, because the devil will try to isolate you like that and make you believe that you're the only one. You're the only one that's going through this, and you are not worthy of God's love. That's why we get together like this on Sundays. That's why we listen to each other's testimonies. It's the fuel. It's the inspiration that keeps us going. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, the Bible says, After you have suffered for a little while, mm, after we have suffered for a little while, I guess that's why one of the, the spiritual gifts is long-suffering. Tells us right there, this is not going to be easy. So we go back to that, that journey that has the same beginning and the same end, but the stuff in the middle is different. The stuff in the middle is the suffering, the shaping on the potter's wheel. That's why we have to apply these principles, communication with God, catching that vision experiencing his inspiration. But we will be given the strength to keep us moving forward to what we ought to be, transforming us. Is everybody getting this so far? The final principle, and this is my favorite, I think, is the spirit, spiritual principle, the transformative principle of connection. When I first started going to church, was an effort for me to go every Sunday. I would get imaginary tummy aches. I would come up with every excuse in the book, especially if it was football season, before DVRs, of course. Now I can just tape it. I don't miss a thing, but I can't look at my phone because the scores. But back on track here, I, uh, I didn't want to go every week because as long as I had this going on, it was me and God. Everything was good. But he took me to school on that and made me understand the principle of connection. It's not about me. It really hit me when different people in the congregation would come up to me the next Sunday when I did show up, and they'd be like, oh, man, I, I, I really wanted to talk to you last week. I was going through this. I really needed you. And it was like God had me by the back of the head. It's not about me. That's not why I go to church every Sunday. It's about the principle of connection. Connection, simply defined as a relationship of personal intimacy, akin to family ties. People ask me all the time, Tony, how do you go all over Cochise County to these different churches and deliver God's word in front of complete strangers? And I'm like, oh man, are you kidding me? Those are not strangers. Those are, that's my family. Bunch of different buildings, but one church. Amen? Amen? Bunch of different buildings, but one church. And everywhere I go, I feel exactly the same way because it's the body of believers, my brothers and sisters. Another word that's used with the principle of connection is kindred. 
a group of people related to one another, like a family, tribe, or clan, that share the same beliefs, attitudes, and feelings. But here's my favorite. The word Sion. Not Zion, like the city on a hill, but Sion. S-C-I-O-N. It's a horticultural term. And in layman's terms, that deals with plants and agriculture. But the definition's really cool. Check this out. A person born into a rich, important family. A living portion of one plant grafted into another to support and promote its growth. Come on. Then I saw this picture of what a scion is, and it all started making sense. Now, think analogies now. Got one plant, firmly rooted in the ground, experiencing fertilizer, nutrients, sunshine, water, doing good. And then there's this wild shoot that's about to die on the vine. See where I'm going with this? That wild shoot is cut in such a way, and the healthy, nurtured, deeply rooted plant is cut in such a way that the two are grafted in together. So when the wild shoot, we'll call it the Tony shoot, is grafted into the healthy, seeded, planted, nutrient-filled plant, it promotes my growth and supports me. And at some point, you can't tell where one begins and the other ends. Are you feeling me? That gets after the principle of connection and why we come together every Sunday, every Wednesday for Bible study, whatever your spiritual week looks like. Communication, vision, inspiration to go to the distance, but most importantly, getting grafted in. If we go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 7, the Bible says, so that you too may have fellowship as partners with us. And indeed, our fellowship, which is distinguishing mark of born-again believers, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. But if we really walk in the light, That is, live each and every day in conformity with the precepts of God as he himself is in the light. We have true, unbroken fellowship with one another. And finally, in Romans chapter 11, verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off, the wild shoot, and you Gentiles being like that wild olive shoot, were grafted in among them, to share with them the rich root of the olive tree. We are not meant to do this spiritual journey alone. The spiritual journey begins at the altar where we are exploring Christ. We invoke the principle of communication. We begin to grow in Christ when we obtain that vision for our individual lives. Then we get close to Christ as we use the fuel of inspiration. And then we become Christ-centered through the principle of connection or grafting in. What happens at the beginning and at the end is irrelevant. What really matters is the time spent in between those points along the spiritual journey. I had to rededicate my life back to Christ in 2000. 2005, I was saved on November 1st, 1981, and like Sparky, I ran very fast from God for 20-some years. And that second experience at the altar was not as nice as the first one, but thank God it happened and I got back to him. But the time in between the next two points, growing in Christ and then becoming Christ-centered, has sped up since then. And now I find myself in many pulpits on many Sundays all across Cochise County 
I have no idea what the future holds, but I know God has a plan. God has a vision, and it's awesome. (laughs) I hope you were blessed by this word today. Remember those four things, guys. Communication, vision, inspiration, and connection. Get grafted in. Stay plugged in. Live and fulfill your destiny in Christ. God bless you all.